Good morning, church. Merry Christmas, everyone. What in the world is happening out there, huh? This is craziness, total craziness. Hey, I uh, before I get into the message, I want to give a shout out to uh, the team that went out yesterday for our monthly homeless ministry. Uh, give them a hand real quick. They did an awesome job. I, we have a few pictures I wanted to show you. Yes, yesterday was just, it was a big group, and of course we had this crazy weather, and uh, they'd been praying all week for good weather, and God gave them good weather. Um, he saved it all for today, so th- thank you all for pushing. No, I'm teasing. Should we need, next time we're praying for two days of good weather. No. Um, so these guys just, they went out, they did a great job, they, they handed out all the supplies and just prayed with people, and just, it was fun. When they, I was here when they left and got to pray with them before they left, before they went, and then when they got back, Anthony called me and just was just beaming. I mean, just he's like, I have no words to tell you all the amazing things that happened today. And I just wanted to celebrate that. Uh, I just love all the, all the things that are happening uh, at, at th- through Harvest. You're just doing an amazing job. And uh, I want to tell you, two, we have, we have kind of two things happening today. And I just, every once in a while, I like to like, you know, bring you into what things that are going on. And, and I'm going to ask you to pray with me. We always pray at the beginning of the message, a quick prayer that we kind of open our hearts and position our hearts. And so today we're going to do two two prayers in one because um, today Pastor Jerry, who loves Pastor Jerry? Everyone loves Pastor Jerry. I, I always tease him. I'm like, Pastor Jerry, you can do no wrong. Everybody loves you. It, it, her, him and Lisa, like yeah, they, can do, they can do anything they want. Everybody loves Jerry and Lisa. Um, but Pastor Jerry is uh, preaching at a church here in Albuquerque called Albuquerque Revival Center. And uh, texted him early this morning, just said, Pastor Jerry, praying for you and proud of you and can't wait to hear the reports of how, how God's going to use you. And I just, I, I really enjoy, I, I, I don't like when our people, our, our team are not with us, but I do love getting to send them out to, to uh, be the expression of Christ in a local church. And so Pastor Jerry's there. And then uh, Nick Martinez is actually at a church this morning in Pruitt, New Mexico. It's one of our churches on the reservation uh, out there. And he's, he's out there today. And I don't know, there was an excitement in my heart this morning as I got up and started to prepare for uh, today to think of the, 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 the extension of what's happening today. And so I just, um, I told both those guys we'd be praying for them today. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to join me in praying for them. And, and then we're going to also tag on to that, this prayer, where we just open our own hearts. See, here's the deal. We believe that God's word is living and active. Do you believe that? What that means is unlike any other book, okay? Uh, some of you maybe are readers. I like to read books. And, and I, they're, they're fun. But listen, once you've read any other book, you're kind of done. Like you've read it, it's been there, done that, okay? The Bible is so different because it has this action aspect to it, the Holy Spirit, every time you open it, can give you something fresh and new. I mean, it's, I, I don't, it's unlike any book you've ever read. So we come to this moment and we say, hey, we know that today we're not just here to just be here. We want God to speak to us. And so we just pause, we open our hearts, we ask the Lord to speak to us. And it's just, it's so fun. I mean, literally every week to hear the testimonies of what God's doing and how he's teaching us and helping us to grow and challenging us. And so I I would, I would encourage you to pray this prayer because uh, I'm telling you, it changes everything about this moment. So how many of you pray that prayer with me today? All right, so let's pray. We'll pray for Jerry, for Nick, and for our own hearts. So Father, thank you for the work that's happening today here and uh, in Pruitt and at Albuquerque Revival. We just lift up Pastor Jerry and Nick, and we ask that you would anoint them and use them today in amazing ways. And Lord, as we get ready to open the Word of God, we take this moment so seriously We're asking that you would speak to us today in this moment. You know exactly what we need today. And so we're we're just positioning our hearts. Holy Spirit, have your way today in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. We're in a series right now called He Gets Us. Uh, There's a campaign that's happening right now across the nation by the same name. And and I, I heard about it probably a year ago and was kind of intrigued and started just paying a little bit of attention to it. And, and really out of that, this, this idea my heart kind of grew to just take a few weeks to talk about who Jesus is, what he said, what he did, and how he changes our lives. And so we've, we, that's what we've been doing the last few weeks. 
weeks. And this week, I, I, just, I read something. I just wanted to, to tell you about it because I think it's pretty cool. So you might know, I, I've mentioned this, that the He Gets Us campaign actually did uh, two Super Bowl commercials. And I, I love this because very few people watch the Super Bowl, but everyone watches the commercials, right? And they, they had two commercials, one in the first half, one in the second half. And uh, I read an article this week that is by USA Today. There were 54 commercials in the Super Bowl. All right, 54. And they, they actually ranked them uh, uh, like best to worst or most popular to least popular. And I was kind of interested. I'm like, oh, I wonder where the, the he gets this commercials kind of landed. And I was really happily surprised because uh, they landed number eight and number 15. Those are, that's strong. 54 Super Bowl commercials. That, I mean, for a commercial to be about Jesus and to be the number eight commercial in the Super Bowl, that is pretty awesome. Wouldn't you agree? with that. And, and here's the deal. Here's the deal, okay? I, I just love, okay, what, what you think about the campaign or don't think about it. Here's what I love. I love that people are talking about Jesus. I mean, wouldn't you agree? That's a, that's a good thing, right? People are talking about Jesus. And, and that was kind of the hope in my heart for this series is that, and I'll tell you, it's happening for me, is that we would fall in love with Jesus, that we would fall in love with Jesus over and uh, over and over, that, that, that we would grow, that we would learn, that we would be challenged. That, that, and honestly, one of my prayers is that, that those that do not yet know Jesus would discover Jesus. And, I, and I, I really believe this. I believe that following Jesus is the greatest adventure of anyone's life ever. Like it's the most fun. It's the most challenging. I just, it's absolutely amazing. And, and part of why I I talk about it that way is that I grew up in church. Let me just see real quick. How many of you grew up in, in some kind of a church? Anyone? Okay, a bunch of us, right? I grew up in church, and I'll just be honest. Early on, um, it just kind of, it just was boring. I mean, it was just, is that okay for me to say that? And, and I had this idea of following Jesus that it was like, listen, if you follow Jesus, then your life is just going to be boring for the rest of your life. That's just how it felt, right? No pastor ever said that. It's just kind of what I thought. You know, and, and there was a part of me that was like, why would I ever want to follow Jesus? Like, I don't, I don't understand. Like, I, I had this idea that Christians don't ever have fun, right? That, that if you become a Christian, you don't get to laugh anymore. You don't get to have fun. You don't get to. And I just, I'm just telling you, I missed the boat completely because following Jesus is the most fun thing that you will ever, ever do. And so I love that we're talking about Jesus. I love that. Okay, so this series, is, it's primarily about Jesus, and kind of the subplot is about how he gets us, how he understands us. It's really, it's really a lot about the, the humanity of Jesus. Uh, this week, I was reading in uh, uh, the YouVersion Bible app that the, they actually have six or seven He Gets Us uh, weekly um, reading plans, and so I was reading one of these, and, and I'll just, this was one line. It just caught my attention. I took a screenshot. It said, a closer look at Jesus Reveal someone who is like us and at the same time bigger than us. And then it asked this question. It said, will you give that a pause? And I was, I was actually, I was out on a walk. I was, I was walking this, this tra trail by our kids' school. And I dropped them off and I was reading this. And I was just kind of walking. And I'm I read that and I, lit I literally paused. Like I, I read that and I paused and I thought, that's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing that God sent his son that he sent Jesus to be a human just like you and I. And that, that phrase, it's like he, he's like us and yet at the same time he's bigger than us. That's, that's quite a thought, right? It's, it's, it's an amazing thing to think that Jesus was both fully God and fully man. And he did that so that he wasn't this far off God who could never empathize with us, could never understand. I mean, he came to the earth so he could understand fully our feelings our emotions our temptations our desires like I, it's pretty amazing to me that he came so that he could relate to you and I now I, I, th this series I've been looking for things about the humanity of Jesus and to help us understand this idea that he gets us and, and in the last couple of weeks I was thinking you know one of the most rewarding and also I believe complicated parts of being a human is our relationships with one another would you agree with that it's one of the most rewarding 
and complicated, right? Or we have, we have, we have all these, these relationships. You have family relationships, right? You have work relationships. You have church relationships. You have neighbors. You have, you have coworkers. You have friends. You have, you, have, you have all these different relationships to manage. And so I started looking at this idea of how does Jesus get us when it comes to the relationships that we have? Because I, for sure, Jesus gets relationships. And so today, I just want to take a, a few minutes to look at what we can learn from Jesus as it relates to our friendships, okay? That, that's really the part I want to I talk about. Is how does he get us when it comes to our friendships? I think you'll agree with this, that in the past couple of years, that culture has made some shifts that have, have complicated our relationships. I, I just was thinking this week about how we have far less human contact than probably we've ever had, right? Like communication, right, has, has changed to, from face-to-face to phone calls to text messages and emails and all, all these non-personal, like it, it was kind of humorous to me. We, a few years ago, hired a young lady to work at the church. She was going to serve as my assistant. And one day I said to her, we were going over kind of a list and I said, hey, so I need you to call, you know, these couple of places and take care of this and check on this person and do this. And, and I could see this, this fear on her face as I said that. And, and, and I didn't understand until later uh, so later I checked in on her and I'm like, did you make those phone calls? She goes, no, but I sent some emails and text messages and I researched this on the internet. And I'm like, listen, I just need you to pick up the phone and like call and actually talk to the uh, other person and just find out. And she looked at me, she goes, I'm so scared of phone calls. I'm like, what? I, I do not understand this. Right? Communication has shifted. And in, in recent years, it's getting even worse, right? We, o- we order ahead, right? On, we use our favorite app to the places that we're going to. I mean, like, like truth, I, I do this, okay? There's a Starbucks near my kid's school. And very often, I drop them off. I punch my order in, I get there, it tells me my order's ready, I walk in, I talk to no one, I make eye contact with no one, I don't want any, I walk in, I get my drink, has my name on it, and I walk out, right, I get out, I'm like, Phew. I didn't have to say anything to anybody, it was awesome, right? Now, if I'm being social, if I want I, I, I to, have, I have it in me to do that, but in that context, I just want to get my order and get out of there, I don't really want, I don't care how your day's going, I just, right? We order ahead, Right? My pet peeve right now is I go to a grocery store and I get all my food in my basket and I go to the register thinking that there will be an employee to help me, but I have to check myself out, right? No human contact, right? Contactless payment and working from home and Zoom meetings. I'm just, I'm so tired of Zoom meetings. I just, right? Like all of these things, and there, there's some good sides to this. There really, really are, but all of it has complicated relationships. We, we just don't have as many face-to-face interactions as we used to have. And, and I, I have a little bit of a, I don't know, a concern that, that maybe we're forgetting how to be human, right? That we're forgetting how to, how to converse with one another and check on one another and take care of one another. And for sure, all of these things, I, I'm thankful for the technology, but it has put a distance between us. The, the distance has, has grown, right? I think we're out of practice when it comes to face-to-face interaction. So, so I've been thinking about all that, and I'm thinking about Jesus, and I'm wondering, how can, how can Jesus and the life that he lived, if we look at who Jesus is, what he said, what he did, what, what can we learn from his life? So just a real quick survey of Jesus in the scriptures, okay? You all know the Christmas story, all right? Christmas story, uh, Jesus is born to a virgin named Mary. There's no room in the hotel, so he's in a, he's in a manger surrounded by farm animals, right? And the star is shining and the angels are singing. We, we all know, we all know that story. Now here's what's interesting. So we have baby Jesus, 
The next thing that we know about Jesus, we see in Luke chapter 2, verse 41. And now, so Jesus is, is a baby, and the next thing we know, he's 12 years old, right? There's this kind of this big gap. We don't know anything about the first 12 years of his life. And in Luke chapter 2, he's 12. His parents have gone to Jerusalem for a festival called Passover. And it says this, after the festival is over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus return, uh, stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware. His parents were unaware of it. Thinking he's, he was with them in their company, they traveled on for a day, and they began looking for him among their relatives and friends, and then they didn't find him, so they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. Now, just real, real quick, parents, okay, parents in the room, how many of you have ever lost your child, even just for a little bit? Come on, anyone lost? This is okay. It'll feel good to just get this off your chest, okay? You've lost your child. Okay, um, how many of you now will reverse it? You have been lost by your parent, okay? All right, okay, wait, keep your hands in the air. Keep your hands in the air. Jesus understands, okay? He, he understands the abandonment issues. He, he, get, he, get, he gets us, all right? Um, Lisa and I, we were, we were living in Texas, and there was this big museum that we took the girls to. Eden was really, really little, and, it, and this museum had the longest uh, escalator that I think we'd ever seen in our lives. And a moment came where it got a little confusing and Eden ended up going one way and we went the other way. And then there was no easy way to get back to where, you know, Eden was. And she was really little and she was crying and a security guard picked her up and it took me a while. Like we knew it right away. We knew that we had lost her, right? But it, I had to get back to her and it was complicated. And I got to her and that security guard holding her, and Eden, I mean, she's just so cute. She was always cute. Even little, she was even cuter. Big eyes, and tears coming out of her eyes, and the security guard's just holding her, and, and he's like, are you her father? And I'm like, yes, I'm her father, and he's just looking at me, like, judging me, and I'm like, listen, dude, when you grow up, and you have your own kids, all right, you'll understand. Just stop judging me. Give me my daughter back, all right, you know? And I'm, anyway, it was, he, Jesus gets us. He's 12 years old, he stayed back in the temple. Mom and dad don't know where he is. They go back to Jerusalem. Watch this. After three days, they <laughs> after three days, y'all, <laughs> they didn't know where 12-year-old Jesus was for three days. We could go, where did he sleep? What did he eat? What was he doing? Right? This is crazy. We don't, we don't know anything about this three-day period, all right? After three days, right, they found him in the temple court sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And I love this line. Everyone who heard him, 12-year-old Jesus, was amazed at his understanding and his answers, okay? So we have baby Jesus. We have 12-year-old Jesus, the very next chapter, okay, and now John the Baptist is a, is a pivotal character in the Gospels, and John the Baptist is baptizing people, which, by the way, um, we, we didn't announce it, I don't think, or maybe I missed it, but we're doing water baptisms on Easter Sunday. I'm so, so excited. If you want to participate in that, you can sign up uh, online or through the Church Center app. I'm so excited. So John the Baptist, he's baptizing people. He's literally preparing the way for Jesus to come is kind of what he's doing, and, and this scene happens, okay? Okay, this is the next chapter. So baby Jesus, 12-year-old Jesus, and now it says this, Luke chapter 3. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son, so this is God the Father, you are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased." So Jesus is being baptized, so he's, he's zero or one day old, he's 12 years old, and now he's being baptized, and it says this, now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. So are these snapshots, little baby Jesus, 12-year-old Jesus, now he's 30, 
and he's starting his ministry. We don't know, we don't know anything from 0 to 12. We don't know for anything from 12 to 18, except that he's, he's living in, in Mary and Joseph's home, and Joseph's a carpenter, and so he's probably apprenticing with his dad. He's learning some skills, but we don't, we don't know. We don't have stories from that, that time period of his life. There's this 18-year gap between this, his 12, and, and when he's in the temple, he's astonishing the priest, and now He's starting his ministry. But what I do know is that that 18-year that, that gap, that a lot of life happened, right? When I was thinking about, you know, we're, we're in this phase of, like, raising our, our children, right? We have one in middle school, one in high school, and one in college. And so we're, 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 we got all this phase where we're, 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 we're raising kids. Yesterday, we were at a wedding. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. And then the father-daughter dance happened. And I just, I didn't lose it on the outside, but I lost it on the inside, y'all. I mean, on the inside, I'm like, I am not ready for this, okay? I am not ready. Ready for this. Like, like those years, those years are so pivotal, right? There, there's so much learning that happens. And specifically, specifically, there's a lot that we learn in those years about friendship, right? Like, I, I don't know if this happens in your home, but, but our kids are, are navigating friendships, right? In, in elementary school and then in junior high and then in high school. They're, they're navigating. They're learning, right? They're learning about relationships. They're learning if they can trust people. They're, they're, they're getting their feelings hurt. There's, there's all these things that are happening. We're trying to teach them. And, and so we don't know exactly what happened, but in those years, Jesus under Mary and Joseph, he's learning how to navigate friendship. And, and I'll just say this, is that you can look at an adult and you, you, can, you can see, you can learn a lot about how their parents did and the lessons they learned in those years. And I, I'm, looking, I'm looking at Jesus, I'm like, Mary and Joseph must have done a pretty good job at training him in the area of relationships, okay, in the area of relationships. So in the next chapter, Jesus Jesus is led into the wilderness to be tempted. And we actually talked about this passage a couple of weeks ago. And this is where the public ministry of Jesus really begins. So he's baptized, and then he goes into the desert to be tempted. And then out of this season, this is where his public ministry, it just, and it just takes off. I mean, it's like, bam, it happens, okay? He starts out by casting out an evil spirit. Then he heals Simon's mother-in-law who has a high fever. And then it says this, now I'm in Luke 4. So this is just literally the first four chapters of Luke. We're just getting a quick synopsis of, of Jesus. Luke 4 says this, verse 40, at sunset, the people brought, uh, brought, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness and laying his hands on each one he healed them. So, I mean, this is quick. He's baptized, and then he's, and then he's in the desert to be tempted, and now he's healing people, and, and the word is spreading, and they're bringing more and more people to him. And Jesus now, the picture is this, is that he's kind of operated in obscurity, right, for 30 years. He's kind of been behind the scenes. There's not a lot of people like, you know, talking about him. They don't know, you know, they're not like, hey, have you seen Jesus? Like, there's not a lot going on. He astonished the priest in the, as a 12-year-old, and there's not a lot more that's happening. But now Jesus is surrounded by a crowd. Now, now he's got people just flocking to him. He's surrounded. And you probably know this, but it, here, here's what's interesting is it's possible to be surrounded by people and still be lonely. It's possible to be surrounded by people and still not be in meaningful relationships. Okay, Walk into any coffee shop any day of the week, any time of the day, and what you'll find is people who are working alone in the middle of a bunch of other people who are also working alone, who none of them know each other, nor do they want to know each other. Right? It's a really strange phenomenon, right? It's like they, they're, they're just ever, you, you can be surrounded by people and still not be in relationship and friendship. In an article by Michael Hyatt called The Leadership Strategy of Jesus, he says this. He says, so much of the activity that I see among leaders today is focused on reaching the masses. So the crowds. This is where Jesus, you know, he's, we see him with crowds. He says, successful leaders speak at big conferences, host popular television or radio shows, publish best-selling books, write successful blogs, or engage in social media. Simply put, their goal is breadth, right? It's to, to go as wide as possible. He says, but Jesus has a much 
different strategy. That's not where he started. His goal was not reach or popularity. In fact, as strange as it sounds today, he actually discouraged publicity. On more than one occasion, after performing a jaw-dropping miracle, he told those who witnessed it, tell no one what you have seen. He says he was a publicist nightmare. Instead, Jesus focused on depth and long-term impact. What I, what I love as we study Jesus is that over and over and over again, he bucks kind of the cultural norm of the day. It's like everyone else is doing it this way, and Jesus comes in and, and does it, it, it. Last week, we looked at those, those phrases in Matthew where he says, you've heard it said, but I tell you, right? That oh, So often, Jesus is showing up and saying, look, I know this is what you've been taught, but here's a new way. I know this is how you've done it, but here's a new way. And, and even in how he manages his friendships, how he navigates his friendships, he comes in with this completely different attitude where he, he, it really seems to imply that crowds are, are overrated, <laughs> right? That, like he was never after a crowd, but he always seemed to, to gather a crowd. But that wasn't his goal. So Jesus goes to work. Here's what we see. He goes to work building relationships with 12 guys, okay? The, the, you know them in the Bible as the disciples, but Jesus would have just said, these are my friends, right? These 12 guys, like these are my buddies, right? These, these, are, these are my friends. And, and I really think that, that he's illustrating for us a great way to live our lives that it's not enough to be a part of a crowd, right? You're, you're part of a crowd right now, right? Uh, you're, you're part of a crowd at your work. You're part of a crowd in your neighborhood. Like, it's not enough to be part of a crowd, but you need some friends. Lisa and I have this phrase. It's not our phrase, but it's just a phrase we use. Doing life together, right? Doing life together together. If you study the Gospels, what you'll see is that Jesus and these 12 men, that that's exactly what they did. They, they did life together. I mean, I mean the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's, it's literally just story after story of Jesus and the disciples, and they're, and they're moving through life, and they're, they're just, they're, I mean, they, they do everything together. They, they stay together. They travel together. They eat together. They're, they're laughing. They're crying. They're learning. They're arguing. They're they're, 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 they're praying together. They're, there's miracles happening. Like all of these, they're just, I mean, bottom line is these 12 guys every day, it was just like they woke up and they said, all right, Jesus, what are we going to do today? And they just followed him around and they just, they just lived life. They, I mean, can you imagine in, in the three years of ministry, like all of the meals that they shared together, right? All of the experiences that they had together. I mean, I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal. I woke up, I don't know, maybe three nights ago with this, this sentence kind of rolling over in my head. It was just this, Jesus chose to do life with friends rather than to live in isolation. I just woke up thinking about this idea that, like, how did Jesus live his life? And, and one of the things I see is that he chose to live life in community. He chose to live with friends. He, I mean, he's the son of God. Let's just be honest. He could have done whatever he wanted, right? He could have lived his life however he wanted, but he, he chose to live in relationship with these 12 men. He, he developed these deep and meaningful friendships. This was his preferred way to live. But Jesus didn't just stop with these 12. Um, and that, that, that's an important layer to, to how we live our lives, to have some great friends. But, but he, he actually took it a little bit deeper. I, I want to show you this in uh, uh, three short passages. I, I'm gonna just, each one's made, like two verses. I, I just want to show you because what we see is that Jesus had these friends, but then he also developed what I'll just call an inner circle. Okay, See, see if you can catch on. All right, Luke chapter 8, uh, Jairus, his daughter has just passed away. They go get Jesus. Jesus and the disciples show up, and then it says in verse 51, and they came to the house, and it says, he, meaning Jesus, allowed no one to enter except Peter and John and James, and the father and the mother of the child. And they were weeping and mourning, and, he, and Jesus says, don't worry, do not weep, for she is not dead, but now she's sleeping. Mark chapter 9, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, 
and John, so we're seeing the same three people appear, and led them to a high mountain by themselves. And this is where the transfiguration happens. This is kind of a crazy story. We don't have time to go into it. But he's transfigured, and his clothes become radiant, intensely white, uh, as no one on earth could bleach them, it says. And then Matthew chapter 26, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray and look again. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, along with them, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. So, so you have this idea that Jesus had these 12 friends that, that he, I mean, they did life together, but we have these three different times that, we're, that we know of where these three significant moments happen, the healing of Jairus' daughter, the transfiguration, and the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane just before Jesus is arrested. And each of those times, Jesus he does something unique. He, I, I mean, I honestly, this is a piece of, I'd love to know. How did he navigate, right, pulling these three guys in closer without making the other ones upset, right? Like, like how did he, I mean, he comes to these moments like, hey, Peter, James, John, y'all are coming with me. I, just, just be honest. How would you feel if you're one of the others, right? I would be upset. Anyone else? Why do I not get to go, Jesus? I don't understand. What I mean, Peter, he's always he's impulsive. He's he's always doing crazy stuff. He's always getting you in trouble, Jesus. Bring me instead, right? I don't know how he did it. But but three different times he brings Peter, James, and John in. They're the kind of the, the inner circle. These guys, these guys are close friends, okay? They're not just friends, they are close friends friends. Uh, we were at a birthday party for Pastor Jace a few weeks ago, and uh, I don't know how we started talking about it. Um, their daughter, Skylar, was home from college, and we started talking about best friends. And, and Skylar taught me some other alternative names for best friends, okay? So, so some of these I haven't heard, all right? So like like uh, besties, all right? Anyone, anyone ever? Besties. And so we, talked, we laughed about that. Or, or, or she said, you could call someone your ride or die. All right, that, that's another, another way to say best friend, my, my ride or die. And then she threw one at me. I never heard it, um, but I, I just, I, I like it. I'm t- I took it. She said, you could call someone your twin flame. And I'm like, that's it. And I looked at Jace. I said, Jace, you're my twin flame from here on. And we made a little handshake where we go like this. We go. And so his birthday card was already on the counter, and I went over, and I took it, and I went in the other room, and I changed it. I crossed his name out, I put Pastor Jason on the front, and I, I said, to my twin flame, and I put it back, all right? I've never heard that term. I'm still not sure, but listen, uh, you, need, you, need some, uh, you need some twin flames in your life, all right? You need some besties, right? You need some ride or dies. You, you need some close friends in your life. I'm talking people that know you forwards and backwards. I called one of my best friends this week, and this is how the conversation started. I said, I need you to process something with me because I'm having a hard time judging my motives, but I think you'll be able to see through it, and I'm giving you permission to just tell me the truth. You need someone like that. You need someone that can help you to see the things that you can't see. You need someone that has permission to tell you the things you don't even want to hear, right? You need someone that, that, that knows you, that reads your mail, that tells you. I mean, I'm just telling you, when I look at Jesus, I see this pattern where he had, he had 12 friends that he did life with, but then he had three friends that he knew he could count on them no matter what. And I just, I hope that you have that kind of a friend. I, I was reading a, a guy, author and social scientist, uh, Arthur Brooks, and, and he had this, this analogy or this way of talking about friends I never heard. He, says, he said, you have real friends and you have deal friends, okay? Real friends and deal friends. Deal friends are transactional, okay? Deal friends are, it's, it's about what you can do for them and what they can do for you. Um, you, you, you don't have a deep, you know, meaningful relationship, but, but they're there. If, if you need to get something and done, or you need to, you, you could ask a, you know, phone a friend, right? You could phone a friend, you could ask him a question. They're, those are deal friends, but, but he talks about you, you got to have some real friends. 
In one of the articles I read, it says the average adult has roughly 16 people that they would classify as friends. Of those, three are friends for life, and five are people that they really like. The other eight are not people they would hang out with one-on-one on a regular basis. Isn't that interesting? But they're my friends, right? It's like I have these, these eight friends that we don't talk very often, but, but if I need something, that's, that's a deal friend, right? That's, that's a deal friend. And I'm just, I'm watching, I'm trying to learn from Jesus, and, and I'm seeing how he has these 12 friends that he does life with, and then he has these three that, that he just really, he brings them in close. And, and if, you, if you go and you study like church history, you have Peter, James, and John. Those are the three that got really close to Jesus. And you look at what happens after Jesus is crucified. Those three, more than any other, are used to continue to take the message of Jesus, to plant churches, to evangelize, to continue to take what they had learned from Jesus and continue to spread that message. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm convinced that it's so, so important how we manage our friendships. I want to I end with a passage in John chapter 15 where Jesus makes this incredible, this incredible statement. This is the, this is the statement he makes. I, I, I just find it so incredible. He says, you, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, so that, that counts for you and I. We're, we're followers of Christ. He says, you are my friends. Let, let that sink in for just a moment. Jesus says to you and I, you are my friends. I I don't know what your perception might be of a relationship with Jesus, but I would would offer to you that this statement should frame your relationship with Jesus. He says to you and I today, you are my friends friends. That, that is how Jesus would like to frame the relationship with you. He would love to be your friend. <laughs> we started the year this year with a series on prayer, and, and one of the things I just kind of kept coming back to in that series was that, that what if prayer looked more like an ongoing text message with your best friend, may, you know, with your spouse, with someone that you're in deep, meaningful relationship, meaning it was just like this, this all-day thing of just, just one text. One text, one sentence prayer, one sentence prayer, one sentence prayer. That's how we interact with our friends. And, and, and this statement caught me in John chapter 15. You are my friend. Someone today probably needs to hear those words that Jesus would love to be your friend. John chapter 15. Let me read the entire passage. Start in verse 12. It says, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. And greater love is no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I, uh, if you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything I've learned from my father, I've now made known to you. And I love this. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Would you just hear that from the voice of Jesus today? He says, he says look, I chose you. I have, I have these memories when I read those words of um, elementary school kickball during recess. I, I don't know what game you played during recess. We played kickball every recess. And, and have you ever been in this situation, whatever the sport was, where everyone lines up and there's two team captains, right? And they're usually the best, right? And they're like, they, they, they start picking and they're like, I want Joe, you know, and he's like, I want Wanda, you know, and I want Lisa. They're all picking. And like, what's the worst thing ever, right? It's to be the last person, right? And you know what happens when it's the last person and there's an odd number? Then they fight over, they're like, no, you can have, you can have Jason. Dude, I'm right here. I can literally hear, right? You ever, anyone, anyone ever, anyone ever have that happen? Yeah. Jesus gets you, just, you know. Jesus says, I chose you. I chose you. You might think you chose him because you walked into a service one day and you heard a message and you lifted a hand and you prayed a prayer. Jesus chose you. And he wants to be your friend. He says, I chose you that you might, and I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command Love each other. 
So this amazing declaration that we are friends of Jesus is sandwiched between two teachings that help us with our friendship with one another, right? He, he starts out and he says, love each other as I have loved you. And then he talks, he says, I, you're, we're friends. And then he says at the end, this is my command, love one another. So I come to this conclusion that the mark of being a friend of Jesus is being a good friend to others. I say it again, the mark, the, the, the proof that you're a friend of Jesus is how you treat one another. It's, it's, it's in how you live out your friendship with one another. Why don't you stand with me today? One of the things we've been doing in this season, probably four weeks ago, I started really challenging you that I felt like this was a season of, of, uh, of harvest and to, to encourage you to really pray for friends that you have that, that don't know Christ and to, to be intentional about, you know, inviting them to, you know, to church, to extravaganza, to Easter, to, to all these things, you know, that, that, that we're doing. And, and, uh, Man, I just got to tell you some some really exciting things have been happening. I, I told you how how a couple of weeks ago how someone came up after church and and said, Pastor, when you when we prayed the prayer at the end, my friend that I've been praying for for you know a long time, they were standing beside me and they prayed the prayer. You know, I, I shared that with you, and and I just I just wanted to read I wanted to read a text that that we got this week. Lisa got it. I asked her right before I said, Hey, hey, share that text with me. Someone texted this week, they said this, they said, my longtime prayers were answered. My younger brother is now saved and has accepted Jesus. God is good and faithful. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? I'm, tell, I'm just, I'm telling you, like right now, okay, we got, we're, we're two weeks from Easter, okay? I'm just telling you, there's, there's something in the atmosphere around the the Easter holiday, because this, this is the whole point of Easter, is that he was raised from the dead to defeat sin, to defeat death, to defeat sickness, to defeat everything you'll ever come. I'm just telling you, there's something, whether, whether an unsaved friend recognize it or not, there's something in the atmosphere in this season. And I'm just trying to encourage you. I'm trying to press into this time. Like, this is the time to, to pray for your, your friend. This is, this is the time to to come alongside and encourage your friend, to invite your friend, to take a, a bold step, right? Sometimes with friends, we're afraid, right, to, to, to take that step and to, to, to let them know that, that it breaks our heart that they don't know Jesus, right? So think of it this way. Think of it this way. Remember Jesus said, you are my friend, right? You know what happens to me quite often is I have one friend over here and I have one friend over here and this friend doesn't know this friend, but I know both of them, and I'm like, oh my goodness, if you knew this person, y'all would, would love each other. Do you have anyone in your life that you, sometimes I'll do that. Sometimes I introduce people like that, right? I'm like, hey, 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 come here. You need to know my other friend, and I introduce them, right? That, that's, all, that's exactly how we do it with Jesus. It's, exact, it's like, hey, I have this best friend, his name is Jesus. He's totally transformed my life and I would love to introduce you, my, my friend, to my other friend, right? That's all it is. Like, we don't need to overcomplicate it. And so in this Easter season, I just, I just wanna encourage you, I wanna encourage you. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna sing one final worship song. We have, uh, we have a team that's getting the room ready for the egg stuffing party right now. We have a team that's getting Dion's pizza and salad against my better judgment, okay? So you don't, have, listen, you don't have to worry about anything except this moment, okay? Everything's being taken care of right now. We're gonna sing one worship song. I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna lead you, I'm gonna lead you in a couple of prayers. I, I just wanna prep you. I wanna tell you where we're going, okay? So you can prepare your heart. I told you in this series that every single week I'm gonna give an invitation for you to surrender your heart to Christ. So we're gonna do that first because that's the most important. Here's the second one. I, I just sent so strongly early, early this morning to pray for, I literally wrote in my notes, all things friends, okay? I don't know, I don't know what, what's going on in your friend relationships right now, but I really believe that the Holy Spirit just wants to, to help you in your friend relationships. 
Maybe there's a healing. Maybe there's a forgiving. There's, I don't know, something that needs to happen. I just I want to pray for you and your, your friend relationships. And then this, this, this has nothing to do with friends, but it's just what I, I felt the Holy Spirit prompt me this morning is that we're going to pray at the end for those that need a healing in your body. Okay, I just, I'm like, I kind of argued with the Lord. I'm like, that has nothing to do with friendship. He's like, just do what I say. I said, okay. So that's what we're going to do, all right? So worship team, why don't you lead us? Would you open your heart in these final moments? This, this is the most important, this is the most important part of the day. So what does Jesus want to do in these final moments as we surrender our hearts?